with Trace. How are you, Trace? Very good, thank you. Now, we've got a very special car here, um, winning quite a, a number of awards here today. Can you go through the awards that you've won today? All right. Um, first of all, we've got the uh, Best Costume Award. All right. And we've got our friends here who have joined us in with this. It's Zeke and Ruth. Come on over. Today, of course, we uh, we all dressed as um, 1920s flappers. Um, and it was a bit of a hot day, wasn't it? It was, yeah. So we've got the, the costume award, so that was that one. Yeah. And that was the wine. Oh, a bottle of wine, of course. Um, then the car that's behind us, the 1926 Sunbeam Lawn um, was voted people's choice for the car show today. We were absolutely stoked about that, I tell you. Um, and... Um, I guess if you win people's choice, I guess you have to get best in show as well, doesn't it? It sort of goes without saying, so that was that one as well. And best in show, what, so what do they look for? What, what does that mean exactly? I think it's a bit like a dog, you know. It's look of most. The one they like, the look of most, yeah. I think it's the car that presents itself best for its age. Um, to my mind, I'm thinking like there's a BMW driving off there at the minute. And, and I thought that was an absolutely superbly presented vehicle today. Um, but I think they do look at the age of the vehicle comes into it. So if you've got something that's only, you know, 18 months old, compared to something that's actually, um, this vehicle is actually uh, 60 years old, 80 years old, sorry. Um, so there's a lot more effort into maintaining, well, firstly restoring and maintaining something like this. Yeah. Um, we've had this vehicle 14 years now and we haven't done a lot of work on it but any work that we do do on it is of the highest quality so and we're, we're absolutely chuffed that we've picked up these awards today so it's it's kind of it's reflected on the work that we've done on the vehicle yeah and, and of course this big trophy which is, uh, which is the Motor Friends Concourse so best in show? People's choice, yeah. People's, People's choice. Show. Yeah, so that'll be engraved and that'll go back to the club next year. So. Yep. And, and the car itself, so how, how, a little bit about the history of the car. A little bit about the history. The car was uh, delivered here to Australia in 1926. It was the Governor General of Queensland's car and it was used for the sole purpose of transporting the Governor General and any other dignitaries around Queensland um, during that early time. After a 40 year reign, um, the, the family that was used to supply drivers for that, um, the car fell into the hands of a couple of collectors um, and then it went through a couple of auction companies. Um, the car was put up for auction a couple of times but wasn't sold and we were just fortunate enough to be able to pick it up from someone who was trying to get rid of it and we managed to get the car. Yeah. Well it looks great, it looks fantastic and very well deserved of course of, the, of, of getting the I suppose the car of the day. Um, looks absolutely beautiful so thanks very much Trace. Thank you. And, and thanks to the girls. Thank you. Thank you. Here I am with Keith and John. Keith, the uh, owner of the car, and John, the restorer. Now, Keith, um, how long have you had this car for? Two years. Okay, and, and did you, uh, what, what sort of condition was it when you bought it? Uh, had a lot of work done, but it needed a lot more. It was sort of half and half. Halfway restored, I think, is the best way to call it, yeah. And that was your job? Yeah, that's my job, yep. Take the restoration. You know, is that something you do full-time? You've done... Full -time, yeah, mainly I work on English cars, Daimless. I'm a member of the Daimler Club, and I, I just work mainly on Daimless, but we thought to do something American, so a bit different. Yeah. Uh, different? Uh, in what way? Oh, well, you got... It's a totally different construction. you got Ameri uh, you know English cars with a coach built. Everything's hand-built. American cars are a bit... I don't know, more... Just more off the assembly line. Off the assembly line, yeah, yeah. So totally different sort of kettle. So is it more enjoyable doing something like this though? Oh yeah, I love doing any sort of restoration. I'm right into it. I love cars and yeah, restoration's my game. So you have your own? 
Oh, yeah, got my own cars. Yeah, yeah. Is that here today? No, no, not. Mine are never on the road. I get them on the road and I end up selling them for some reason and I move on to something else. But Something else. It's like a people renovate houses, move in, renovate, move exactly. to get another one. Get get on the next one. That's what I do. So how long have you been a, a member of uh, Motor Friends? Well, uh, well, I'm not really. He's the, he's the man that um, I'm only here to see the car. <laughs> oh, I've got the Daimler over there. Um, well, how long have you been a, a member I'm of Motor Friends? But I'm, I'm sort of an affiliate. Uh, I, I judge their cars. I've been judging them for about four years, five years in a row now, yeah. So you're judging today? Yeah, I judge today, yeah. So what, what do you actually look for when you're judging uh, a car? Normally I look for, because um, I'm, I'm into restoration, I really look for that restored vehicle. But today we went for more something a little unusual. We went for those cars that you probably take a bit more guts to restore, you know, it's cars you wouldn't normally restore. So, yeah. so, you, so you want to reward someone who's put in quite a bit of effort? In effort for something that you normally wouldn't see restored. So that's what we went for today. It was quite good. I thought the, the selection of cars was quite unique today. Yeah, very good, different. All right. Fantastic. Thanks, Keith and John. <laughs> and here I am talking to Ethan. Hello, Ethan. You're a bit shy. So is this your car? Yeah. And where do you drive your car? Um, to, to Australia. Around Australia. So Daddy doesn't mind you driving around Australia? Yeah. Yeah. Are you, are you, are you safe? Are you careful? Yeah. Yeah, you've got to be careful on the road. You don't drink, of course, don't you? Yeah, no, you wouldn't do that. No. no. And how, when, when did you get this? Did you get this car for Christmas or birthday or something? Yeah. Or did you just steal it? Did you steal it? Yeah. Yeah? Off who? Of another little kid? I put it in the, the water. In the water? Oh, is it a, one of those cars that floats? Yeah. Okay, so you go down to the beach and have a bit of a swim and that. Well, it looks pretty good. Thanks for talking to us, Ethan. It was nice having a chat with you. So wave goodbye to the camera. Bye. Bye. We've got a short break coming up right now. Don't go away because we've got more midsummer coming up. Hi, I'm Vic Perry. I'm with the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives, and we're uh, going to join them on the History Walk 2006, part of the Midsummer Festival, and we're going to check out everything that's queer and camp in the city of Melbourne. Let's have a look. <laughs> Right, I'll just start off actually, before we start our walk, I'll start off with a brief uh, overview history of Melbourne, just so you've got a bit of general context to be going along with. Melbourne was actually founded in 1835, and unlike other major cities in Australia, it wasn't a government-sponsored exercise, it was, and it wasn't a convict settlement. It was actually uh, formed by a group of entrepreneurs, farmers from Tasmania, who, having taken up all the land that was uh, available to take in Tasmania, sort of started looking across Bass Strait for uh, fresh fields. And so in 1835, uh, two competing groups arrived here in Melbourne and set up, uh, one of them had a farm down at Spencer Street Station, and the other one had a farm where the old customs house is, uh, John Pascoe Faulkner and John Batman. And uh, the two of them were uh, competing as to who would be the founder of Melbourne, and they both actually sort of tie for the uh, thing. Batman unfortunately died early of syphilis and kind of uh, got forgotten about. Faulkner uh, lived to be into his 70s and became a member of Parliament, so guess who took all the glory? So, uh, for the first 15 years of its uh, existence, Melbourne was a fairly steadily growing small place and uh, was the main exit port and entry port for the uh, entire Port Phillip district, that is what's now the state of Victoria. But in 1850, when gold was discovered up in the, uh, up in the hinterland at Ballarat, Bendigo and up in the Ovens River district around Beechworth, the whole place just boomed and the population sort of went, increased tenfold within ten years. So the place became incredibly rich and very, very important in the scheme of things. And for the whole of the rest of the 19th century, Melbourne was the largest city 
on the Australian continent, far bigger than Sydney at the time. Now Sydney's got a fairly well documented gay history going back into the uh, 19th century. But Melbourne actually hasn't had so much work done on it. And that's one of the things we're trying to do with the history walks is to uncover this stuff. The problem with uh, gay and lesbian history is it's always been a silent history. It's been a hidden history. And generally, the only real um, written sources we've got for a lot of the stuff, particularly the 19th century stuff, is in court reports and uh, newspaper articles. And of course, they are detailing stories of people who weren't you know, they were, they're the people who got caught. They're the, the unsuccessful stories, if you like. Uh, and it's, it's written from the point of view of the people who, you know, don't like gays and lesbians. So when you're looking at this stuff, you've actually got to read between the lines. So that if you find that someone's been arrested in a park for uh, you know, public nuisance or indecent dealings or something like that, indecent assault, you think, aha, that park, if one person's been caught there, there are obviously other people who are doing the same thing there and they haven't been caught, so we'll never know about them. But we know that that park probably was a meeting point. It's the successful lives. It's the people who lived happy and successful gay and lesbian lives in the 19th century and the early 20th century that we don't hear about. And, uh, or, you know, very occasionally you'll hear references in biographies and things like that, but it's, it's by and large official sources for the early history that we have, and that's what we're uncovering uh, at the archives. Now, we decided to actually start the walk here at the State Library for a number of reasons. <clears throat> the State Library is the repository of Victoria's history, rather like the archives. They've been going a bit longer than we have. For most of uh, the library's existence, of course, they didn't collect gay and lesbian history. Nobody did. But just in the last few years, in the last 10 years, the library's collecting policy has changed and they are now actively collecting gay and lesbian history. The other thing we like about this uh, particular spot, the State Library, here we are out the front between a naked man on a horse and a cross-dressing girl on a horse, Joan of Arc and St George. Um, I don't know what people read into these things, but when I was a kid and I used to come into town, I always like that one. This is just a quick point to stop. We've got a number of them on our walk. So we're not actually going to go up and have a look at the exact spot, but you can always pop back and have a look later on. One block up here, up Russell Street. So I'll get it right, Russell, Lonsdale. <laughs> One block up Russell Street there, on the corner of La Trobe, the old police headquarters, the Russell Street Police Headquarters, opposite the city court building. Now, important particularly in uh, the history of gay men in Melbourne, under the uh, legislation that was in power before 1982, it was uh, sexual relations between gay men that were actually illegal. Lesbianism was never actually illegal per se and uh, the story goes that uh, we, we of course take our legislation in the 19th century from the UK and the old story goes that in 1885 when they were drafting the legislation they actually put, they, they were going to put lesbians into the equation as well except nobody could actually figure out how they'd explain it to Queen Victoria when she came to sign the bill that, uh, you know, lesbians actually exist. So they thought it was probably just easier not to even mention the L word and, uh, and, and Queen Victoria would uh, rest more, more, more happily that way. So it's gay men who are targeted by the police and the legal system. One of the most interesting little stories I've ever heard with that one, 1936, a drag queen called Percy was busted in Collins Street by a policeman. Or rather, the policeman saw him in Collins Street and followed him home on the tram Elwood and arrested him outside his house in Elwood. Monday morning, Percy's in the dock at the city court in drag. The magistrate, the judge, however, said that he looked at Percy's outfit, frock, stockings, gloves, hat, and said that if women could wear jodhpurs and beach pyjamas in the street, Percy was actually better dressed than most women. Case dismissed. I'd like to know what that judge got up to after hours. I really would. Anyway, 
One block further along, our next stop, we're heading into Melbourne's theatre district. We're just going to go to a short break, don't go away, we'll be back for more Queer and Camp Melbourne. Welcome back to the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives History of Walk 2006. We've got so much more to see. Let's have a look. The theatre land glamour has kind of disappeared apart from parts like of the city like this. So it was a, it was a haven for, um, for the creative types and what was known as theatrical. And the, the, the openness of the theatre allowed for um, the sorts of things that weren't allowed for in the, for the wider society, particularly male and female impersonators, who were, uh, well, in earlier centuries, um, there were no women on stage or men played female roles. Um, but in the 19th century, just male and female impersonators per se became popular parts of um, various acts. Um, and they ran the uh, gamut from um, uh, pantomime dames who were, who were men dressed up as women playing the funny old bag role to uh, men who dressed as women in order to uh, do the best impersonation they could and hopefully fool the audience. Also, uh, male impersonators, women who were dressed as men and try and fool the audience or just simply um, behave slightly differently and unexpectedly. And this is, that's in, interestingly, as we heard before, cross-dressing on the stage was fine, but if you walked on, on the street, you could be arrested. The mis male, male and female impersonators were very popular, and many actors made it, um, their uh, whole career. Uh, and actors are very mobile in the 19th century and early 20th century. There are many, um, who, many who appeared in Melbourne, and some who came from Melbourne and moved to the rest of the world. In Melbourne, one thing we know in the 1950s that the word theatrical became a byword for um, homosexual. As Val of Val's Coffee Shop said, the majority of customers were gay, but all theatrical people came. <laughs> just before we head off, I just want to make mention here that um, we're also, not just in theatre land, but we're also in the middle of the old 19th century red light district of, um, of Melbourne. Now, we're being inclusive here. This is not the gay red light district or the lesbian red light district. This is the straight red light district. Uh, but we are being very inclusive. The only reference we have to a gay brothel in Melbourne uh, comes from the 1890s. Rumours uh, exist of uh, a brothel over in Richmond, which was run by someone who'd actually made his money on the goldfields in Bendigo, and then with his much younger boyfriend set up a house over somewhere behind the Richmond Town Hall. It was never busted by the police, which means, of course, we've got no official records of it. And one of the reasons why it was never busted by the police, or so the rumour goes, is that it enjoyed vice-regal patronage, all those aides de camp from Government House heading across the river for some fun. That's the only gay brothel uh, story we have in, uh, in Melbourne. But I'd like to actually introduce you to Claire Larman, who actually runs uh, tours of Melbourne's red light district in Little Lonsdale Street. And Claire's just going to give us a little bit of a flavour for what things were like on the other side of the fence in the 19th century. <laughs> a number of the uh, brothels uh, that were most notorious were up around Lonsdale and Little Lon because they're a lot of the, as you know, a lot of the um, laneways and little streets were service lanes. Ha, funny about that. <laughs> Parliament House was. Um, notorious for uh, the, the gentleman would go to Madame Brussels which was one of the most notorious brothels of early Melbourne and that was 32 to 34 Lonsdale Street. It had a back entrance um, in Little Lon and uh, gentlemen would surreptitiously go through there. Now I can't say whether they were all straight, I don't think they were but um, they in fact had uh, vice regal uh, connections as well. Madame Brussels was eventually busted. She was closed down a number of times. 
Um, the rumour about the mace being stolen from Parliament House was rumoured to have gone to Madame Brussels. In fact, uh, we researched and found that it went to Annie Wilson's, which was around this corner over the other opposite side. And um, they apparently danced all night with this six foot long gold mace. So, you know, it, it abounds. Here I am with Gary Jones, one of the organisers of the History Walk. How are you, Gary? G'day, Vic. Yeah, it's been pretty good so far. It's been quite interesting. I think it's been a successful day, yeah. yeah. Now, the, the uh, archives have run a, a few of these walks in the past. Um, how does this one compare with the others? Well, uh, we started running in 85, 1985. Helen Pausica was the, I the originator of the idea. I only used to run them every few years in those days. And then in 1999, with midsummer, uh, we started running them again and regularly annually since then. They got too big. Um, we had over 150 people at our St Kilda walk and we were just finding it a bit unmanageable. People couldn't hear properly with tram noise and whatever. So we split them this year for the first time. So that's why the booking system. So numbers are only now about 50 to 60. But we're pretty happy the way it's gone. Yeah, like, even both walks have been booked out and oh you've yeah. still got extra people who have yeah. wanted to, to yeah. come along. We could have easily run a third walk if we'd had the, the planning done in advance. Yeah. And what, what sort of, uh, you know, thinking of sort of demographics of the uh, the groups, what sort of age group, what sort of people you get along well, to these things? This, there has been a noticeable change this year, a much younger cohort, um, particularly the first walk, which was the 43 degree Sunday here in Melbourne, if we still fill our numbers. Um, I would have thought on uh, perhaps a 30 to 40 age group in that. Today, perhaps a, a touch older, but a lot more women. I think in the registrations, we had about 75% women, which again is quite unusual. We've normally had probably more blokes than women, always reasonable amount of women, but not the, the high percentage of this year. Where are you based? We're based at the Victorian AIDS Council, um, where we house probably a third of the collection, but we don't fit. So we've got stuff all over Melbourne. Uh, and that is a, an ongoing problem for us, but if people want to donate, we'd do our very best to accommodate them. So how, how can people get in touch with the archives to donate? Uh, if they've got the internet, just do a, a Google on ALGA or the Australian Lesbian and Gay Archives. Uh, you'll see our leaflets if you're in at the Victorian AIDS Council. They're on the leaflet rack there. Um, our email address is algarchives at hotmail.com. Yeah. Pretty simple. And a phone number too? Uh, 9499 1769. And uh, if, if that's not answered, we'll soon get back to you. We're all a totally voluntary organisation, so uh, don't come with the expectation that we're resourced like the State Library. That's not Yeah, no, fair, fair enough, like most community groups. Yeah. That, uh, um, uh, and so, you know, it's easy enough to do a Google search, or you're in the uh, also directory. Oh, in the also directory. Sure. No worries. All right, thanks very much, Gary. Hope you enjoyed Queer and Camp Melbourne. That was the Australian Lisbon and Gay Archives History Walk 2006, part of the Midsummer Festival. We're going to go now, but uh, make sure you tune in next week for more Midsummer Festival.